Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we will begin shortly, just waiting for more people to sign on, um, and then we can get started. Okay. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining tonight um, on this, uh, this very special office hours on fuel reduction strategies for the transportation department. Uh, and another uh, amazing episode of NYC Film Green Office Hours. So I am Anna Laura and I'm the Education and Special Programs Manager at Earth Angel, uh, a sustainable production consultancy helping to reduce the environmental impact of film and television television production. This Office Hours event is held by the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, which is the agency in the New York City government that supports creative industries. They've created the NYC Film Green as a way to promote sustainable film production uh, and develop resources like today's event, as well as many more that will soon be rolled out on the NYC Film Green uh, website. Uh, to support productions in the city who want to take steps to reduce their environmental impact. Uh, sorry, just having some technical issues. There we go. Uh, okay. So we are going to have a panel discussion between uh, 5.15 and 6 o'clock with our amazing panelists. Um, and then we'll, this will be followed by a little Q&A with, uh, with our panelists. Uh, this will be followed by uh, um, uh, our office hours section, which will be an open forum for any questions on sustainable production that you might have. Uh, panelists are welcome to stay for this section. Um, and you can ask any sorts of questions, not just on fuel reduction strategies. Um, so all questions are welcome. Uh, and so the film, so according to the US Department of Energy, each gallon of gasoline burned creates 20 pounds of greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming and climate change. This translates to approximately five to nine tons of greenhouse gases each year for a typical vehicle. Um, and to keep in mind, one ton is about the size of a two-story home. And the film and television industry has a large environmental impact, uh, and one of its largest environmental impact areas is in fuel consumption. The Sustainable Production Alliance, um, commonly known as SPA, released a report outlining industry-wide production carbon emission averages for certain productions between 2016 and 2019, including both feature films and television series. And what this report found was that across the board, fuel emissions derived mainly from transportation and generators uh, comprised an average of 48% of the total carbon footprint. As such, it is imperative that we find energy sources that don't emit greenhouse gases while still fulfilling our industry's energy needs. So we've brought together a panel of experts here for you today to discuss how the transportation department can reduce their reliance on fossil fuels by turning toward cleaner energy sources, alternative fuels, and more efficient fleet management. With us today is uh, Shannon Bart, um, Senior Manager of Sustainability and Productions at Netflix. Uh, she, um, she's responsible for leading Netflix's sustainability strategy for its, for its global productions. And her work has a strong focus on reducing fuel use from production of operations through optimizing electrifying and decarbonizing production power and fleets. Uh, prior, to com prior to coming to Netflix, Shannon was sustainability director at NBC Universal, where she created and led the sustainable production program for over a decade and was a founding member of the Sustainable Production Alliance. Mike Devereaux, uh, transport captain of the theatrical Teamsters Local 817, started in the motion picture picture industry in 2005 as a driver um, for, for the local 817. And throughout his career, Mike has represented the union as a Teamster capstan, 
a business agent and political coordinator. He's worked on various productions such as Law and Order, Law and Order SVU, Spider-Man 3, Oceans 8, John Wick 3, and presently CBS's East New York. Uh, Matt, Lu uh, Matt Luke uh, from Nesty. As Nesty's technical manager for North America, Matt Luke serves as the principal technical point of contact for the Renewable Road Transport team, providing expertise to stakeholders about renewable fuels position in the larger energy picture, how it works in engines, the value it provides, and its widespread applications. Matt believes that all solutions are needed to fight climate change, and renewable fuels will be a big part of the energy mix in the future. Uh, from Edge Auto Rental, Matthew Price is the Director of Operations at Edge Auto Rental with a focus on sustainability initiatives. And with Matthew today is Keith Gordon from Edge Auto's sister company, Emerald Trailers. Keith is sure to bring some great insights on fuel reduction on the trailers, um, on the trailer side, as they are 100% electric and solar powered. And from Shattered Prism, Adam Shippey owns and manages Shattered Prism, a sustainable equipment rental company with a focus on portable electric power solutions. Adam launched Shattered Prism in 2019 with his brother Parker, who also works as a lighting designer. Uh, Shattered Prism now has locations in filming hubs across the US and has helped over 100 productions power their sets more sustainably. Some prominent recent productions served in the New York area include the Law & Order franchises, Imaginary Friends, Poker Face, SNL and leave the world behind. Okay. Uh, all right. So welcome panelists. I'm very excited to have you all here. Uh, I guess we can turn on our videos now. Perfect. Welcome, welcome. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, and we'll start with fuel usage. So uh, let's uh, start with what are the main sources of fuel consumption on productions? And I, I'll, I'll give that question to Mike Devereaux. Thank you, Anna Laura. I guess I'll, I'll start this off. Um, I think mainly you have your, you know, you know, your generators, your base camp generator, your set generator that are running constantly. They can be running up to, you know, 18 hours a day, depending on how long the, sh the shoot is. Um, and your trucks, your, your set dressing trucks and your rigging trucks, because they're driving all day, are probably the, the um, and vans are probably the leading uh, transportation, um, the leading fuel uh, intake in, in production. Of course. And... How much would you say, uh, how much fuel would you say that production typically uses for a feature or a TV series? Um, I would say like a, a, an NBC show, like a, a procedural eight episode, um, eight day episode in a week could go through about 900 gallons of diesel and like, uh, and about 700 gallons of gasoline in one week. That's, that's a big number uh that's a very big number um yeah, it also, it also is, depends if you're out how many days you're out how many days you're in the studio but that's just on an average of course um, yeah and um i think i think you're right mike it really depends on the type of production um if you look at the spa regional emissions report that they recent that was recently put out here I can, i'll put the link in the chat um, it, it does call out specifically New York and averages across a number of productions. So, um, according to that report, a one hour scripted drama, similar to what you're saying, Mike, um, has about 40 metric tons of carbon from fuel per episode. And if you do the backwards math on that, it's about over 4,000 gallons potentially per episode on average. So if you have a more studio-based show, I think it's it's less, right? Like procedural. And then if you have a show that's out on the on the on the road a lot or you're needing a lot of generators, it could increase that for sure. I've also seen generators used for heating um, in New York, which can obviously increase um, the amount of fuel used. And then on the film side, 
um, in that report here. I'm not good at talking and showing links at the same time, but I will share that. Um, is a medium sized film in New York has about 300 metric tons of, of from fuel, which if you do the math backwards, um, it's over 31,000 gallons of fuel. And that's assuming about a, a mix of half gas, half diesel. Um, that's how I've kind of seen some fuel come in. I don't know, Mike, if you see more diesel now these days versus gas. Yeah, I mean, the the study that I did is, is I just had a couple of productions send me their SC fuel. It's the car that they use to purchase fuel. And I took all the gallons of gas and all the gallons of diesel per week and kind of took a couple of different jobs and did an average on that. And that's what numbers I came out to. Um, I think that's the best way of gauging um, right now in New York over the past, you know, in, in December, at least. And, and you're going to burn more diesel when it's, you need air conditioning or you need, um, or gasoline when you need air conditioning or you need heat, um, then maybe the, the more moderate climate months. But um, it's also New York uses, uh, if they have air conditioning when we're on location, sometimes they use a separate generator just for that, because if they use a generator to power set and a power air conditioning, you can start tripping out, um, you know, the filming, and then you'll have to cut and obviously roll again. So that's another issue. So I was going to ask um, on uh, more on what you just mentioned, you you started tracking your own productions usage or or getting that information. So are, are you seeing productions in general tracking um, their fuel use in in any way, other than you just collecting them? I mean, I would, I would think definitely on a studio standpoint, they have to, because they have to, each vendor does. Like I know um, one of the big vendors we use on the job I'm on is it ads and they have to pay a tax on it. So they need the, the fuel receipts and they need to, you know, document that and, you know, just, or, you know, so they can pay the right amount of tax on the fuel that's used on their uh, vehicles. So they're, they're definitely tracking it as well as the studios are tracking it. And it's simple because the SU fuels gives you a report and you just see all the gallons and the diesel and the regular fuel that you're using on a weekly basis. Right. And Netflix, or sorry, uh, Shannon, can you uh, elaborate on your shows? Yeah, I think, um, as Mike said, there's a lot probably tracking fuel at different levels. I know um, many of the major studios, including Netflix, do ask our accounting teams to track how much fuel is purchased and report that back, um, we fold that into our corporate carbon footprint reporting. And so that's um, the fuel that's burned is considered a scope one emission, which is, is something that is really important to reduce um, as a responsible company kind of across the board. So the first step to figuring out how to reduce it is to track it and find out how much you're using. Perfect. Um, thank you for that. All right, let's move forward in, unless anybody else has anything else to say on fuel usage, uh, we can move on to alternative fuels. Uh, so can you describe the various alternative fuels available and their benefits? And this one I will direct to Matt Luke, uh, Luke at uh, Nesty. Yeah, so there's, um, there's a lot of alternative fuels out there. Um, you know, you've got, like on the transportation side, we've got gasoline and diesel, but also renewable diesel, biodiesel, hydrogen, compressed natural gas, all these other things. Um, for power generation and, and things that, that this group is mostly working on, I'd say the alternative diesel fuels are, are obviously the most popular, right? There is no real renewable gasoline option out there, but there are renewable diesel options um, that can offset the, the use right now. So I guess for, from my perspective, maybe a little bias here, I think renewable diesel is probably a the best for what you guys are looking for, because it's a it's a drop in solution that you know it doesn't require any work. Um, and there's no blend limits to it either, so you can use it at a full replacement um, for what you're doing now to realize a, a lot more benefit. And is it so? Is this renewable diesel um, readily available in New York City? At the moment, no. Um, and I think part of the conversation here is, you know, maybe you guys can help us with a few things. But right now, the, the core market for renewable diesel is the West Coast, because those states from California, really all the way up to British Columbia, have these low carbon fuel programs in place. 
which it helps producers like us offset the higher production costs that it takes to make the fuel. Um, you know, we, we can take fuel anywhere that it's needed. There's just some transport logistics, things like that. Um, I think looking toward the future from a public affairs kind of perspective here, everyone at any, any company in the biofuels industry is kind of watching New York right now because, you know, like I said, the entire West Coast has got programs in place. California led the way, and then Oregon just a few years ago got theirs in place, and Washington State just got theirs. The, the general consensus is that New York will be next and probably draw in a few neighboring states as kind of a regional program. Um, and that's really going to open doors for getting a lot, a lot of this fuel over into that area. One of the things that I would love to add is, you know, Renewable Diesel, uh, DCAS, who's in charge of New York City's uh, fleet, did a pilot in 2019 um, with Renewable Diesel. And one of the deputy commissioners over there um, is really responsible for transitioning the fleet into electric vehicles. And um, I know that there's a lot of people in DCAS that want to go with Renewable Diesel. Um, I've talked with some, I guess you would say distributors. Um, I talked to one of the uh, distributors that was responsible for one of the pilots. And um, basically they're just looking for an anchor customer. And if DCAS did sign off with them, like I myself, uh, with help of um, one of our vendors, Tommy from Walton, um, have got a commitment from probably the leading um, fuel station where our trucks fuel up at to give us one of the 4,000 tanks they have with diesel to put renewable diesel in it. So um, if that anchor customer did come to New York, like DCAS or the ferries or someone like that, we already have a gas station where we could get our vehicles fueled up and we could send our, our, our fuel trucks ready to go and to start pumping. And one of the distributors that they that I've talked to, they use anyway. So it'd be a seamless transition to go right into it. And just one more note on that. You kind of mentioned that the anchor customer, right? Like I said, the, the entire market doesn't have to be there for just one person to get the fuel. There's always options for that. You know, we fueled um, like the, the Global Citizen Festival in New York. Um, where we took dedicated fuel just for that customer out there. So there are other options on the table before or without just waiting for the legislature and everything else to be put in place. I would imagine it'd be a lot more expensive with a smaller customer than with a bigger customer. Right? Uh, there, there's a transport cost, yeah. yeah. That sounds great. I, I like that there's, it, it's the infrastructure is almost there. It's ready uh, and it's ready to be, to just be, um, used, which is really great. Um, and that's the great thing, Anne Laura, about renewable diesel is that there are vendors that are signed up that will, like are some of the biggest vendors like Kadaz and Walton in New York are ready to, to use it. You know, it's not like biodiesel where biodiesel, you constantly have to change the filters. You know, it's made with, I believe, like um, like uh, vegetables and you'd have a, at, a, at a heat, uh, you'd have it growing mold or it'd have a, a higher freezing point where renewable diesel doesn't. So a lot of vendors are more um, willing to use renewable diesel than they would be with uh, biodiesel. Mike, do you want my job? You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing a lot of research on this. <laughs> every, everything Mike's saying is really accurate. Um, and we can kind of get into some of the benefits, like operationally, if you guys want to talk about that as well. Um, but if we don't have time here, yeah. I'll just let you guys know, we're actually doing a workshop in Greenwich on March 1st. And if anyone here would like an invite to that, um, let me know afterwards and we can make sure you get the info. That's great. Um, you touched on really good um, point there that there is a difference between the biodiesel and renewable diesel. So do you wanna talk a little bit towards that and how it might impact production? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start Mike, you can catch anything I miss. Um, they're both made from the same stuff, from waste and residues, right? These renewable raw materials, whether it's used cooking oil or, you know, animal fat or, or whatever else. The, the difference is in the production, the chemistry, like the actual refining process to make it. And what comes out, um, they both run diesel engines. The thing is, renewable diesel is a hydrocarbon, so it's a direct replacement for fossil, whereas the bio is it's, its other molecule, right? Which means you can only use it up to a 20% blend. So if your goal is GHG reduction, 80% of your fuel still has to be fossil. You're only getting the benefit in that 20% portion, right? Whereas with renewable diesel, because you can run it at a 100% rate, you know, when we say we can provide up to a 75% GHG reduction compared to the fossil baseline, that's because we don't have to blend it with anything. It's just a, a neat product going in the tank. And, you know, you don't have to get rid of what was in the tank 
you can just start blending them. They're fully fungible and the other stuff will just blend itself out. Um, and I guess from an operational view, you know, especially with power generation, the fuel itself is aromatic free. It's just aromatics are a type of molecule that it's what makes diesel exhaust carcinogenic. We don't really have those in our fuel. So if you're around generators and other stationary equipment all day, you're not necessarily getting the, the big negative health impacts that you would from a fossil diesel exhaust stream. Um, and then, you know, there's other longer term benefits for the equipment itself. You, we can reduce maintenance costs. We can reduce downtime, um, stuff like that. But I think from the, uh, from the environmental health perspective, there's some, some big immediate benefits you can get. I like that not only are there environmental um, benefits, but also for the, be for the benefit of the people that are working right around the generators. They're not just breathing in uh, fumes all day. Yes, some of our, our big customers, like I'm actually, I'm calling in from Portland, from a hotel right now. And the city of Portland, all of their, their fire departments run on our fuel because, you know, this equipment has to start up inside the firehouse and drive out. And when they come back, they have to back into the firehouse. They're filling that firehouse with, with exhaust. And just knowing that they're already exposed to all this other stuff doing their job, they don't need to add one more thing to it. So switching to our fuel just allows them to strike that off the list and not have to worry about it. Perfect. Uh, and then moving to actually using it on productions, Shannon, can you speak a little bit towards um, uh, experience using biodiesel or sorry, renewable diesel uh, or alternative fuels in general on, on your productions? Yeah, so renewable diesel is great. Um, a number, of, most of our productions in Los Angeles and London um, use it throughout their generators and their vehicles. Um, it's more easily available in those cities right now than it is in other cities. So in markets where it's it's you can get it as easy as you can get other fuel, our productions have been leaning it and getting it. And then and we haven't had any problems with it. As Matt said, it's fantastic. It is definitely not the same product as biodiesel. And we see it as a transition fuel. So as we're working to electrify our fleets and to shift to clean mobile power sources, renewable diesel is that good bridge. To, to reduce emissions and, and improve air quality um, among the performance improvements that you see as well when you're on a cleaner burning fuel. Um, we've also used some green hydrogen um, that's currently available to productions only in the UK. Yes. Uh, and with that one, the, uh, the bright product is actually clean water. Which is, yes, it's water. Uh, really you great. Can drink. I have drank the yeah. water from coming yeah. out of the hydrogen fuel cell. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you for that. Uh, are there any other hesitancies with using renewable fuels uh, in general? I'll jump in first, and then anyone else yep. can also. Yep. Um, I think a lot of it is just um, an educational thing. Because I know, like Shannon just said, it's not biodiesel, but maybe a lot of people don't, if they have no experience with it, they're, they're not making that distinction in their head and they probably have had a bad experience with the biodiesel in the past. And so it's just kind of overcoming that message. Um, and then honestly, the, the only other downside really, as we kind of touched on in the beginning, is just availability right now, is getting it to certain places where it's needed because it's not, it's not coast to coast at the moment. Um, you know, but from operational standpoint and everything else, there's really, there's no downside to it. Um, and that, that sounds like a cop-out answer. People ask, you know, well, what's the catch? But th there really isn't one once you, once you have the fuel in your tank. And that's, and to go on to Matt's point, that's exactly like the first time I heard about renewable diesel, I was thinking biodiesel. And I said, oh no, we've had problems with biodiesel. That's the first thing I said. And the person was like, no, 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 it's renewable diesel. Look into it, you know, and um, I'm working on a Warner Brothers show right now. And uh, Josh Newell has helped me significantly about, you know, about renewable diesel because they use it in LA and they use it in Vancouver. And it's comforting to us because it's a lot colder in Vancouver and it's a lot warmer in LA. So those are the two biggest factors in New York are the cold and the heat. And if it's working in those two, uh, those two areas, then, I mean, it just comforts me to know that it would probably work here too. Yeah. And to your point, Mike, the city of Vancouver has switched over to it. And so it, it's definitely trusted there. Um, we have had some productions use it in Vancouver. It's harder to get though. So I love how you were talking to the local fueling station being like, can you, can you make it available here? So that's honestly the, the only hurdle we've had with renewable diesel, the only issue has just been easy access to it. So I think that's the biggest problem to solve. 
The other thing with the name that so um, doesn't help us is that both biodiesel and renewable diesel, I think, and Matt, please correct me, are called considered biofuels. So it's not biodiesel, but it's a biofuel. And then some of the labeling of it, um, it tells you it's a biofuel. And it, most people would just think that then that's biodiesel. So if you see biofuel, it actually still can be renewable diesel. It's not the same as biodiesel. Yeah, it's kind of that whole, you know, a rectangle is a square, or a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Right. There's the umbrella that is bio-based fuels or biofuels that renewable and bio fit under. But then there's the distinction of biodiesel and renewable diesel. And this goes back 10 plus years, 15 years, when renewable diesel first started being produced. And it goes into like the ASTM specifications and everything else of how do we distinguish these? And that's what was landed on. Um, and we're, we're kind of stuck with it now. It's a little too late to change it. But also, if you hear the term HVO, um, it stands for hydro treated vegetable oil. That is the same product. HVO just tends to be the term used in Europe. So if you start reading, looking for articles and stuff, you'll see RD or HVO, they're interchangeable. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and then in, is there a price difference between renewable diesel and regular diesel? So, you know, I mentioned earlier the, the West Coast markets that have those carbon programs in place. <clears throat> in places like that, we can go to market near parity with fossil diesel um, because those credit programs, like I said, allow us to offset the higher production costs and, and things that go along with that. Um, to move off of the West Coast, there are some there's different credit regimes and different rules in different places for different applications. But yeah, like going from a transportation application in California to a power generation application outside of California can impact the price. Um, it depends on the value of those credits on any given day. I mean, it could be anywhere from 50 cents a gallon to $2 a gallon or something, just depending. Um, and, you know, like I said, that, that, that's a lot of market dynamics and things don't we don't control. Um, so it, the answer for New York is not ideal right now. I get that, but we, we're going that way. And that's the one thing that you know what happened in to, when they swapped switched over to ultra low sulfur diesel back years and years ago. You know, and eventually you go through the city agencies and the state agencies, and you get the you know they subsidize the price and things even out. But you just I feel like you need more customers, and hopefully the customers will come. Um, I also liked what Shannon said about, you know, this is, this is a good, you know, until we have the electric vehicles until in a mess, because I always try to remind people that we're not there yet with the trucking. You know, I think this, the sanitation department has seven electric trucks that they have, and it takes, it's a 10 hour um, battery life. And, you know, it's not there yet, you know, so this renewable diesel will lower the emissions by, I believe it's 85% until we wait till the technology comes and you can get the electrical trucking on a, a an industry-wide basis. Perfect. Thank you for those those answers. Uh, okay, so let's move it on to electric vehicles and hybrids. Uh, so, do you consider fuel costs when making decisions about EVs or hybrid rentals? Um, and I'll direct this one as well to to Mike Devereaux, uh, as the one responsible for getting the fleet. One of the um, biggest problems we have in New York, I would say, is that, and I don't want to say it's a problem, but in LA, they their sound stages are owned by the studios, right? So they can set up an infrastructure there and they can have charging stations and they can have everything else. In New York, it's a lot of like, you have a stage, but you have city streets surrounding it, right? So there's no real, you can't really set up the infrastructure on the city street to have charging stations and plugged in. And, you know, this would be something that you could have more electric vehicles if you had more stages that were closed and could plug in i don't see a lot of electric vehicles um you know the vans it's just it's not i haven't come across vans that can really hold a charge for a long time and since they're constantly moving to recharge them in the middle of the day would really put a van out for a longer time so i think in new york we're probably a lot further behind than you are in la i would think with the um, electric vehicles and with like the generators and the campers also, you know, solar has been a great, is a great option maybe in LA, but in New York with the buildings, it takes away the sun and you always have to kick on the generator. You know, our grip trailer actually on our job has solar panels and where it could catch it, it recharges the gate on it. But, you know, a lot of times the buildings are blocking the sun and you come into those challenges. So it seems that uh, it's much, it's more challenges other than just fuel costs 
that are a decision factor in renting uh, EVs or hybrids. Interesting. Uh, so, I mean, this one I'll direct to Matthew Price uh, and Keith Gordon. Um, what types of EVs are currently available in the film industry um, in New York City right now? Sure. Um, so we are currently offering um, a Ford E Transit uh, mid-roof cargo van, a uh, Ford E Transit high-roof cargo van that has some ex extended cargo space. Um, and that high roof is also available with the lift gate. Um, and beyond that, we also have a Chevy Bolt crossover and a Chevy EUV, Chevy Bolt EUV, which is a small SUV, so good for people moving and, and stuff like that. Um, as more vehicles and electric models become available, we are bringing those into our fleet as soon as we can get our hands on them. Um, and then Keith can talk a little bit about our offerings um, from our sister company, uh, Emerald Green Trailers, as far as our solar power, power trailers. Yeah. yeah, so Emerald Trailers, thank you guys for having me on. Uh, Emerald Green Trailers literally launched in New York this week. Uh, I've been doing some show and tells and Mike been meeting with some of your colleagues. Um, but we are offering fully solar and electric powered trailers um, for the industry. Um, so kind of coming in as the first to truly offer a you know, ground up option uh, for trailers in New York. And the batteries for these particular trailers are, we're basing our battery consumption or availability on the length of a shoot day or longer without solar input, because we know that the caverns of uh, the Upper East Side <laughs> prevent solar from always being available and also that, you know, night shoots are obviously very common in New York. So, um, yeah, we're really happy to to bring that option option to New York City as the first. That's great to hear. Um, and what is the average, um, uh, sorry, how, how long can your EVs go for? Uh, what is the gauge on that? Or the... For, the, uh, for the cargo vans, they have a max range of about 120 20 miles um, per full charge. Um, the, the bolts and the small SUV, SUVs are um, around 220 miles per, per full, full charge. Um, and Keith, you're, the, the batteries on the trailers, those are... The, batter, the batteries on the trailers are aiming for approximately 18 hours at average use throughout the day. Um, and they can be extended dramatically with the use of even a little bit of solar. Um, because they're not retrofitted vehicles, everything is extremely high efficiency. And we've found through our testing in New York, even during the cold and uh, you know cloudy overcast days that we've had since much of last week that we're breaking even on power consumption throughout daylight hours, leaving the battery for nighttime use. Oh, that's perfect. Um, sounds great. Mike, you have something to add? Um, I know there's a there's another company too that's that's rolling out probably in April, um, like generators, like electric generators. I think it's like lithium battery, um, like thousand amp generators, which for a teamster captain would be great because the biggest complaints you get are your set generator and your base camp generator. Those are two things that, um, like I met with a council member who's trying to have this bill to limit permits. And his biggest complaint was that the generator noise, you know, and hopefully they could start getting gen the problem with electric generators is that you need a lot bigger of a generator than you do a diesel generator. So it's a bigger structure. Um, but hopefully, you know, with these thousand amp and the technology, they get smaller and smaller and they can go on tractors and they can kind of like we have now, because in New York, it's not about the trucks running as much as the generators running. That's the biggest issue we have with it. And it's more noise complaint than it is the emissions or anything else. But we know with one comes the other. Yeah. And, and for Emerald Green trailers, I can tell you that when once they're parked up, they are still towed by diesel vehicles because the tractors are not electric tractors are not there yet 
although we have our eye on that for the future. Um, it is silent once they're parked up and running. It will de definitely help in that in that regard. And in the pipeline are those massive battery packs with enough to power set and replace, we hope, the onset uh, generators. We're in the testing phase of those, those products rolling out. And I know, uh, obviously, we have Shattered Prism on who's already doing that in, in some capacity as well for, uh, for sets. Perfect. Now you, you mentioned, um, that you're, you're, uh, taking into account the environment of New York. So, and you mentioned the cold weather. So how might cold weather affect battery performance? Sure. Uh, so with, um, with the vehicles themselves, um, you roughly expect to have a decrease in about 10% of, uh, of range in, in weather that we've been seeing lately. Um, you know, when we see that creep up past that point, it's usually from the energy consumption of, you know, sitting idle in the truck with the, with the heat uh, <laughs> with turned up. So it really needs to be mindful of how you're using that energy. Um, but if you're using it in, in normal, in a normal setting, um, it's not going to be material, really. It's going to be 10 to 20 miles, depending on which model that we're talking about, as far as loss of range. And for the, the Emerald trailers uh, batteries, because we don't need to propel a vehicle using them, we're actually using what are called LifePo3 batteries. They are not a lithium ion battery, but a lithium iron phosphate battery, which is less susceptible to heat and cool cold losses. Um, the trade, the and it's also a non-combustible battery, unlike lithium ion. The trade-off being that it's a less energy dense battery and it's also heavier. So that's why in other applications that matters a lot more, but when it's only being pulled into place by a very powerful vehicle and then parked up for the day for use, the trade-off makes sense. Great, thank you. And now I'm curious about um, how many EVs and hybrids are typically rented out for productions um, and what percentage of the fleet that usually makes up. And I'll direct this question to Mike and Shannon. Mike, do you wanna go first? You can go first. <laughs> well, I. I... Electric vehicles are still pretty new to our industry. Um, and right now, for example, in New York, there aren't any trucks available, which is the majority of what is rented. And so I would say it's a really small percentage right now. I would say that um, on many productions, there aren't any electric vehicles. And then on more and more, there's you usually start with electric cars or plug in hybrid electric cars and then work your way up to cargo vans and 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 so forth so we've had a number of electric cars passenger cars and vans and cargo vans on a number of productions we've had um, um kind of globally um and then we are working on piloting more vehicles as they become available and to market so i think as a percentage of your fleet it's going to be very small but i think where you have the opportunity to do it is those that drive especially in cars or the cargo vans that drive around um, a lot. And I think there'll need to be a demand sent to all of the studio owners as well, that DC fast charging is essential. And because we will need DC fast charging um, where these vehicles are parking at night, um, as well as just accessible throughout the city and through at the studios to in order to keep increasing the amount of electric vehicles used by production. And that's one of the issues is, you know, since we don't have the sound stages that are equipped to have the infrastructure for the charging, is that you'd ex someone would have to charge it when they get home or someone would have to charge it. And, you know, if they live in New York City, where are you going to, first of all, a, high, a van, they don't accept in most of the garages in New York City, you know, so it'd have to be an outdoor lot. And they'd also have to, um, you know, I mean, if you're parking on the city street, you're obviously not going to be able to plug it in. Um, I agree with with Shannon is that it's a very small, 
small percentage right now. It's just kind of hard to, especially with the trucking, since they aren't there with the trucks yet. And I, I know they have them and I get that. But just for our industry, since it's such long hours in different places and you're doing company moves, you know, you need something that really could hold the charge a little longer. And um, and that's just not there from my experience and what I've uh, measured, you know. And like I go back to what I said before about the city of New York has, I think, seven electric vehicles for sanitation in their fleet, which is a lot bigger than our fleet. So um, and there was just a test trial and I haven't heard how that trial has gone, but uh, I know those trucks go a lot less uh, hours than than our trucks. So, and that's one of the questions in the chat said, um, why are you guys opting for renewable biodiesel over electric solutions? And that's the reason because, you know, we can cut emissions by 85%. Basically, I'd like to say overnight, it would take a little bit, like a month or two or three months to get renewable diesel, but it's a good band-aid until we actually fix, are able to fix the problem in the long run. Without Disagreeing with Mike, I agree with everything you're saying. I am still incredibly optimistic about electric vehicles. I do think it's the future for a number of vehicles. And the challenge that we have to figure out is how do we recharge them? And there's a lot of really cool mobile charging solutions coming out. And so, and I, that kind of parlays into mobile batteries that I, I know we're going to talk about soon. But I think that there's the interesting thing about our industry is Mike's right. Like we are, we, the vehicles are what out there for 18, how many hours a day, like 16 hours, 18 hours. And sometimes to recharge the batteries at empty, you would, you would need at least 10 hours having them sitting there recharging. So when you look at it that way, it's really tricky. Um, looking at it a different way, a number of our vehicles don't actually drive that many miles a day. Um, and they sit, for long periods of time. So if we can figure out, and I think there's, there's some new solutions coming, they're not fully to market yet, but how to recharge the vehicles while they're working, while they're sitting there, bringing the charge to them. Um, and there's a number of battery solutions with fast charging attached to them, or maybe in the future, there'll be green hydrogen solutions with fast charging attached to it that can meet the vehicles where they're at. That also might be a solution. So, um, you know, we're leaning in everywhere we can get our hands on vehicles. We're testing, piloting, charging them at studio versus charging them on location. Even when we've installed charging stations at studio, the vehicles don't come back for a couple of weeks because they're out on location. So there's, there's lots of challenges in our industry, but I'm very optimistic that we'll, we will figure it out for the vehicles that make the, the most, the biggest impact. And it'll be fun to figure out together. And if I could just make kind of one comment on that also, you know, I saw the, the a Q and A question, I think about focusing on, you know, zero emission. Um, someone mentioned it once, I forget who it was, but think about the, the time value of carbon. You can make a change right now that will eliminate some of that exponential growth of carbon over the next years as those solutions are implemented, right? No one's saying diesel is going to exist forever into the future, but it's a change you can make right now. And you know, even batteries and everything else, they have to be charged at some point, whether, you know, there's the internal combustion versus external combustion kind of running joke and renewables are out there as well. But, you know, if, if a renewable diesel carbon intensity is 25 grams of CO2 per megajoule and the U.S. grid average is 75.6 or something, you know, it, it's hard to say that's not worth the effort right now when it really doesn't cost that much more to do it um, without having to wait for everything else. Thank you so much. Those are very insightful answers. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, clean technology. And so I want to um, ask about experience with clean transportation technologies uh, in lieu of diesel generators. And I'll direct this question to Shannon first. So we, um, we piloted a number of different clean tech solutions on um, Netflix productions in the US, UK, and Europe. And um, there, there's a lot coming out. It's very exciting. Uh, and the, there's batteries that we've used of various sizes. There's hybrid generators where you pair a battery with a generator. Um, so you run that your diesel generator most efficiently as it recharges the battery, then it shuts off and then just the batteries use until it gets low. Um, we've used hydrogen power units. Um, I actually, there's a, we have a video that I'll put in the link that after the panel's over, don't go watch the video now, 
but after the panel's over, um, check out the video where it ex explores a lot of these. But it's it's exciting. The, the cool thing about um, shifting off of diesel generators, as Mike said, that they are the biggest complaint in communities. And so if you can move to a clean, silent power source like batteries, you just get access to more locations. You are, can act more agile uh, with your needs. You have it right next to set. Uh, there's just a lot of benefits with using batteries. And then, and then the hybrid generators and hydrogen power units can provide more like longer times of power because it you either refuel it with the green hydrogen or you refuel it with the diesel and, and it uses it more efficiently. So I'll stop there. I could talk about it for hours, but I'm sure others on the panel have more insight for New York. But yeah, it's, it's really exciting. It's really exciting. Thank you. Um, what about how do we scale the usage of um, some of these clean transportation technologies? And I'll direct that question to Adam. Hey, um, so when you say clean transportation, I'm sorry, I'm not, you mean like uh, battery generators? Sorry, mobile batteries. Um, we, Shannon's mobile batteries. just let us know about many benefits with it. So how can we yes. get more of them? Yeah. Um, well, you know, we've been renting exclusively battery generators since we launched in 2019. That's that's what we focus on. Um, and there's a few challenges, but we're, we're waiting to see as the technology really improve. And, um, you know, our largest unit right now is an 8K, so eight kilowatt hours of capacity, eight kilowatts of output. So, you know, that's not enough to power there's nowhere near enough to power base camp. So you, you, you have to be thinking about applications. So when we acquire our units, we're thinking, where is this going to go? How is it going to be used today? And where we're at now with the size of units we have, there are a lot of applications for those specifically with set power. So we're actually able to really disrupt generator usage within sets. And if you're able to rent enough of the units we currently have available, you can actually power your set entirely with electric power, which is a huge, which is huge progress right there. Um, but larger issues like base camp power, I mean, it's going to take significant innovation uh, on the tech side. I mean, we, we did a great study with Shannon and Netflix on kilowatt hour um, usage, um, both at base camp and set for a couple of their productions. And you're seeing at base camp, you know, 300 kilowatt hours a day being consumed at base camp from generators. Um, that's just to power their trip. Trailers. Um, at set, you're seeing closer to 70 to 100. So again, when you're thinking about an 8K unit with enough of those units, you can recharge, you can power your set through the day, especially with more of um, a versatile kind of nimble model where you have those number of units that you're able to kind of place in different locations and then recharge. You know, where you're filming, there might not be an outlet available, but if you're thinking about it within you know, reach, there might be outlets available. And when you have units that can recharge fully in two and a half hours, you can swap. You can have units powering your set and you can have your other re units recharging at the outlet available nearby. So, you know, already today with the units we have, you're able to do a lot, but we are waiting for more innovation to come on the battery side before they can be deployed and scaled on, on a broader basis. Um, <clears throat> something I'd like to add to that is that what we've been finding as we've been monitoring generators um, kind of across in multiple cities is that the in our film in the film industry, the generators are often much larger than the power loads that are actually required. And so pretty consistently we're seeing that generators are running at uh, a 10% load, a 15% load, sometimes a five or one percent load. I mean, it's really crazy how, um, because we have a 1600 amp generator, that's what's turned on and it's like charging something, it's powering something very small. And this um, is really eye-opening because we really were monitoring generators to figure out, okay, what's the best clean tech solution to you know, power the tech trucks, to power base camps, for sets. And what we found was that, um, 
we could save a lot of fuel just by using our existing diesel generators better. That's not the end goal, but it's something that everybody can do right now. And the, um, and it's not good for the generators to be running such low power loads. Generators are happiest and sure, other than the call can explain this better than me, but generators are happiest running a load at like 60 to 80%. Um, when they're running consistently under 30%, under 20% in that idle, they're more likely to, to break down, they're more likely to require more maintenance. And so um, it's just this like cycle where then our productions are used to having generators that break down. So then we carry more big generators when in fact, we could really get by with much um, more right-sized power sources. And so thinking a little bit more about the power that's actually required by that production in that day, you obviously need a bigger generator for base camp in the winter than you do in the nice mild spring or fall because of the heaters that are running. Um, but it really wastes a lot of fuel right now with how we operate generators. So if we could right size the generator to the actual power needs, you're going to be a lot more efficient with your fuel use too. That was one of the amazing things when I got a um, demonstration of the, the company EcoSilent that has a lithium battery generators was that everything's workable from the phone too. Like you monitor it from the phone. If it goes down, you get an alert on your phone. Everything's kind of just, you know, it's very efficient. That's what I could say. Like, it's not any, there's a bunch of graphs and listen, I'm not an electrician. I'm not a tech person. I don't know much, but from seeing everything, you're like, wow, you can really monitor this, you know, a lot more efficient than you can a regular diesel generator. And um, I just think right now it's taking a long time to manufacture them and get them to um, actually being used. But I think some studios I heard in the next couple of months, you'll start seeing these on set, which is nice. Yeah, but it requires like a big commitment from the productions. And, and as it is, it's it's a big logistical consideration. And the study we did, for instance, you know, a lot of legwork involved, a lot of manpower. It's not as easy as like flipping a switch and you can all of a sudden figure this stuff out. So, you know, right now expecting productions to scale up their electric generator usage would, you know, necessitate a lot more focus on these issues. And as things stand, no Nobody's expressly responsible for that oversight. You know, everybody's kind of you know, got a full plate already. And in the midst of that, it's it's a lot. And, and if they don't have the tools to help them understand what their generator usage is, you know, they're kind of operating blindly. And so, you know, the easiest solution is the one that's that's been used, which is you just get a big generator and you don't have to think about it. So, you know, it's going to take um, commitments from productions and possibly changes in personnel or just shifting around roles um, and then advancements in the technology. But those are kind of some of the hurdles we're facing now to greater adoption. You know, I like to compare this to, I'd say, like almost 20 years ago when we started having to do logs, you know, while driving trucks and it was a federal thing and the law and you know, everyone was like, oh, this is never going to happen. Everyone's going to do it. And the studios set up departments on it. And, you know, it costs a lot more money to log and monitor, you know, drivers and have everyone. But, you know, the studios saw that this is what you need to do. And this is what happened. So they put the money, they put the force behind it and they put the confidence. And that's the one thing If the studio really sets forth in the beginning of a production and says, listen, we have your back on this. We're going to spend a little more money right now on it. And this is where we want to go, then it can happen. If not, then we just have to go with our old conventional ways. Thank you. That those are really great answers. And I'm loving all of the the, the discussion that this is gathering. Uh, so what can the city do to support fuel reduction strategies in New York City specifically? Um, how can the city support uh, productions? Uh, and I ask this to everyone. This is a an open forum question. Well, we obviously prefer the carrot versus the stick model, but I think it starts with you know incentivizing productions properly and offering tax breaks where available for using green energy solutions. Um, there again, one of the challenges or things to keep in mind is it's in order to kind of be able to claim those potential tax credits, you'd have to have some awareness of what you're offsetting. And that, again, might require monitoring. So, you know, it's it's a little bit of like a trade-off and, and what's going to come first, the chicken or the egg. But um, and I think 
some of the things that are done now in terms of limiting limiting generator usage in certain areas have been hugely helpful. I mean, that's been a big driver for our business in that when clients shoot in certain locations, they aren't allowed to use um, generators. Uh, so, you know, that forces them to think of alternatives. And when they know that the alternatives exist and we can kind of consult with them and help them understand what it would take to power their production for the day in those locations, then again, they can feel confident, they can feel good about it. They'll know that they have the capacity that they need to complete their shoot. Um, so maybe expanding that um, kind of model of just nudging productions in the right direction in certain locations, and then also you know incentivizing them for um, adopting clean energy solutions. I think that's one of the, the main points. I think, you know, it's, we have all the support in the world, I think right now from the city and state, you know, with the tax incentive and with, you know, MOM and, you know, we have a, a designated, you know, commissioner, deputy commissioner and staff for our, our industry. Um, I do think it's going to take a little bit of, you know, if you trade in your old truck you, and you get an electric truck, you're going to get a big rebate, you know, something like that. It's just, you know, after them putting so much tax incentive on our industry itself, what are they going to actually give for incentivizing green energies? That's something that's just going to have to come within the industry. And that's just a question that I have. There's no answer, I, I feel. I also think that there's an opportunity to invest in infrastructure. Like, how do you get more access to even level two charging on city streets, something that our production trucks they're parked there for 18 hours they can plug in for you know like it's like having that infrastructure available all throughout the city um engaging with the studio owners and the landlords of frequent filming locations to install not only dc fast charging but access to grid power um you know vancouver and toronto both have a big initiative to install um, kiosks power kiosks london does too in high frequency filming locations it takes a lot of coordination with uh, multiple industries, the power companies. Um, it also is expensive, um, but getting access to power so that we don't have to only rely on bringing our own power in places that are filmed at 200 days a year, I think would also be really helpful if, um, to reduce fuel now. Shannon, I think you might have better awareness about this than I do, but I know from our conversations, like in other places, whether it's Canada or in like in the UK, um, they seem to be better at incentivizing or motivating um, the use of, you know, clean energy, like electric generators, for instance. Is there anything we could learn from those other locations that maybe would be implementable in New York that could move the needle? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the reasons why they're so active is because of exactly conversations like this and the local film office organizing all the stakeholders and like Vancouver just did that. They got a room together. They said, what can we do? And people started working together and, and doing it and finding ways to incentivize the behavior. You know, they, um, Vancouver uh, offers 50% off your location permit if you get rid of a diesel generator. I mean, that's a great carrot, right? That really helps spur the local suppliers to carry more clean tech there. So I think, um, will that work in New York? I don't know, right? So it, it just really depends on what, getting everyone together, figuring out what the hurdles are um, and just trying to knock them down one by one. Um, it just takes that kind of dedicated focus and everyone here um, around the table, just helping to, to figure it out. I think one but, of the biggest hurdles and sorry to, is that the most saturated areas are a little, um, for lack of better terms, sick of us filming in their their neighborhoods, and for them to, you know, see tie-ins starting to put in on even if we paid for them or you know in the, on their streets, it might cause them to get a little more um, annoyed at our industry. You know, as nice as it would be, I'm sure in in Vancouver, there's not as much filming. You know, especially in uh, Williamsburg or Greenpoint. You know, and I think the neighbors would have a lot of pushback if they started really catering towards us and putting tie-ins. It might have to be for a different purpose. Um, I know a lot of the electeds there are very progressive and they're very, you know, for uh, new and green energy solutions. So maybe they would work with us a little more, but I think it would be, I think it'd be tough. That'd be a huge hurdle to get over is the community itself wanting that placed in. Thank you so much for all of these insights. This is, I loved that discussion. I, I definitely, oh, 
Yeah. I just saw a question or somebody posed a question about the mining in the Congo and the impact of lithium batteries. And I do want to say that whether it's Emerald or us using the lithium iron phosphate um, batteries, they don't use cobalt, which is one of those, um, you know, heavily mined um, inputs into lithium batteries. So at least with, with our focus on those uh, batteries that don't involve those inputs, we can not in, make a, another problem worse by trying to solve it, uh, you know, our problem with the climate. So. Thank you for answering that. Um, uh, that was going to be, uh, yeah, I was going to, I was going to get to that, but thank you for doing that. Um, I definitely have more questions, but I wanted to get to the questions in the chat. Uh, so there is another question as well that was posted. Uh, is there any info on the feasibility of recycling EV batteries uh, and maybe percentage of an end life of battery that can be fully recycled and the carbon intensive and carbon intensity needed to recycle it. So a, a number of the EV companies also, when a battery doesn't no longer works in an electric car, there are second lives for it, um, particularly around storage. So pairing it with solar and storage. So there are, there are a number of companies that are taking batteries that no longer are in use in vehicles and shifting them over. I think it's kind of started with the Prius Right, there are a lot of leftover batteries from the Prius, and that's that's a different chemistry as well. But um, there's some great second life alternatives already, where you don't even have to break it down and recycle it. You can um, reuse the battery as it is to store store renewable energy. Um, and then I think there's a battery recycling is is going to be absolutely essential. So I think that there's a lot of new technologies coming out on how to make sure to do that most effectively. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to figure out how to recycle them from both an economic and an environmental standpoint. And, and I think that the materials are too valuable for them not to be recycled. I agree. Going back to battery chemistry, the lithium iron phosphate batteries have a much longer life than just lithium ion batteries. So again, I mean, it at least can help a little bit with that. With You're able to use them longer, they're more durable, long lasting. So it at least kicks that issue or that can down the road a little bit rather than making it a 10 year issue. It's more of a 20 or 30 year you know, consideration. Uh, perfect. So there are two more questions. One of them, wondering if a green initiative would flow into crew rentals, rentals for job classifications that are contractual or commonplace. Um, I, yeah, I had a question regarding, sorry, wondering. Uh, I had a question regarding the idling issue with our trucks and drivers in New York City, sometimes idling for heat, et cetera. I believe some of the tractors used with the emerald green trailers could limit that potential. Uh, the, the emerald green tractors are the newest version of diesel tractor trailers and uh, also utilize the edge fleet, which has rather new um, like it's a new fleet, not, not very old vehicles. So they are, you know, I, I would let Matt speak on their exact exhaust, but, um, it's at the, t the front end of what's available now for internal combustion engines. The, the trailers are currently being pulled by, um, by diesel trucks at this point. So they'd still be, um, you know, susceptible to any idling laws within New York City, if that was the question. Yeah. And the, the trailers do not provide power to the tractors. Like they're not, we're not running heaters in the in the cabs of the tractors off of the batteries of the tractors. It, it's only, it's completely separate. There's no, no sharing of power between the two. But I think, you know, sharing of power could be good in that, especially as we are able to place with, with clean tech, um, you know, one of the the things we did observe from our study was that occasionally a tractor would be used to power heat for a truck cab, you know, and you're, you're using a 1600 amp generator to power a space heater. Um, that's again, what we're talking about is really low loads, you know, using more fuel than is needed. So. I also think like, it could... be plugged into. I think with the, in the future, there will be a lot more vehicle to grid scenarios where you could use an electric tractor's battery to help power, um, provide power needs, 
or maybe then if the solar trailers generate more power than they need, they can then, you know, recharge the tractor. I think that it's all possible in the future mm -hmm. um, with the right technology and the right efficiencies. We have to be really energy efficient to make that work, right? So um, I think that that's pretty exciting, the ideas of what could be possible in, in the future. I also think like one of the one of the biggest things is that, you know, especially on set trucks, you know, they're not running. In my experience, a lot of them aren't running for heat. They're running for the gate. Um, they usually have their space heaters or their their other ways to keep cold that they plug into the generator, like um Adam was was speaking of before. Uh one of the biggest things is, you know, running the gate on like an offset truck. A lot of times they get tickets for that, but they're in the gate. I've had experiences where I've had a ticket and I've been in the back of the truck and they wrote a ticket and I had to fight it and tell them that I was in the back of the truck. And it's kind of proving your point, proving you have to like prove that you were in the back of the truck somehow. And, you know, I did get off of it, luckily. Uh, one of the other issues is that I've had to explain to neighborhood residents that it's not the truck running, it's the generator. You know, it's the thing behind the truck. You know, they, they don't seem to, a lot of people don't seem to grasp that they're two separate, actually, since they're attached, but they're actually two separate engines running. And it's like, that's not the truck. And eventually, hopefully, we can, you explain it to them and they get what you're saying. But I think it's going back to the generators are the biggest issue of things running in the New York City streets. Yeah, okay, talking about great. what we're excited about, to your point, Shannon, in terms of it, like innovation and uh, you know, well, like I said, one of our larger units is a 5K model. Um, you know, our manufacturer is telling us that soon that 5K will be a 10K in the same size package. So, you know, that ability to double capacity is really, really powerful and just increases use cases, including for things like po power for um, cabs or, you know, lift gates at the work trucks or whatever it is. So there, there are a lot of innovations that are coming and we're eagerly awaiting them. Um, once they do, it'll be easier to replace uses of diesel or gas generators. And one more note, I always like to say, you know, it always comes from the top, right? So if somebody doesn't need more lights or doesn't need this, or there's less waste when it comes to, I mean, I've been on film shoots where it's just lit up and it doesn't have to be as lit up as it needs to be. I mean, those are certain small changes that might have to happen where, you know, to save a little bit of energy, not to put lights where lights aren't needed necessarily. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, there is another question that's directed to Shannon. Uh, how are you tracking GHGs, uh, sorry, greenhouse gases um, spoke uh, S1s and S2s? So the question is, how are we tracking scope one emissions, which is from the fuel you burn? And mm -hmm. how are you tracking scope two emissions, which is from the electricity you purchase? And those, so those two kind of buckets of emissions um, are often considered in a company's control. And so they are really important to uh, reduce and manage and clean up. Um, for productions, this information is typically tracked through production accounting and in the production accounting software. And um, if some information isn't available, for example, if you're at a stage that doesn't um, provide actual utility bills, then um, other information is required to estimate the energy use at that facility, which can include the size of it, what it's used for, how long you're there. And then that, that is used to estimate the energy used and then translate it to a carbon footprint for the production. But the, the source data is really the purchasing on the production level and that is tracked through production accounting. Perfect. There is another question and it's directed to all panelists. Uh, why are you opting for renewable or biodiesel over electric solutions? I think that's going back to what we said before. It's just, mm -hmm. it's a fast, like you could do it right now. You know, you can overnight, you know, lower the emissions by 85% while you phase in electric vehicles. You know, you just can't change every single vehicle to electric while that's happening and you're phasing out one by one and starting to get new technology. Renewable diesel would be, you know, it's not the all or nothing right now. This is the solution that would really change a lot of our carbon footprint. And why not do that now while we're waiting for the technology to change? 
I do want to point. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And I want to point out something because I think it was put in one of the chats or questions. Um, is that renewable diesel is is so is a much cleaner burn? And Matt, maybe you can help me out with this. Um, and it's life cycle emissions is what re is reduced roughly eighty to 80, sixty to eighty percent depending on the feedstock. So I think there was a comment in one of the questions around the fact that the tailpipe emissions from a carbon standpoint are still about the same from renewable diesel, and that is true. Um, so while it's a much cleaner burn in the sense that there's less particulate matter, there's less NOx emissions, there's not, uh, less uh, other types of, em of emissions that come from combusting diesel, uh, the life, it's the life cycle emissions that are significantly cleaner. Uh, from a greenhouse gas accounting perspective. So if you, depending on how you're counting your carbon footprint, um, you really need to be looking at the whole life cycle for that. So most large companies can take account for the benefits of renewable diesel, um, but at the tailpipe, you're still emitting roughly the same amount of carbon. And Matt, please fact check me on any or all of that. Yeah, <clears throat> that's pretty accurate. Um, you know, the, the analogy I use is, Think about fossil carbon, the, the sequestered 100 million year old diesel coming out of the ground and think of the atmosphere as a sponge. You're just trying to continually fill the sponge and fill the sponge until the sponge overflows one day and we'll see what happens, I guess. What we're doing, we're wringing out the sponge and putting it back and wringing it out, putting it back, right? Yeah, r right now, direct, direct air capture is not a thing, even though a lot of people are working on it. So maybe we can't suck it out of the atmosphere, but we cannot put new carbon into the atmosphere. And you're right, you know, if you need uh, a one megawatt generator, you need the same amount of diesel fuel to make the power to spin the generator, right? But if what's coming out of the tailpipe is not new carbon to the atmosphere, that's still that's still a net benefit there. Um, so in the, on, on the other emission side of stuff, if you want to get more granular than the, the life cycle, even with renewable diesel, you're going to see lower unburned hydrocarbons, lower carbon monoxide. There's the aromatic free benefit. There can be particulate matter and NOx benefits. Like there are other things outside of just the GHD conversation. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering that. Those questions. Uh, there was another question. We kind of touched on uh, the right sizing of the generators. So if productions know that they don't need so much power, why are we still not right sizing the generators? Uh, uh, Shannon, do you want to take that one? Well, I think it's for Mike, but I'm happy to or, or Mike. my opinion, but. I think it's this is more of a production question, you know. Like, I personally, we bring the generators there. Like, I'm not, I don't know what they're running it on. I don't know what, you know, how much lighting is going on. You know, I'm not an electrician. I'm not a a DP. You know, I don't, I don't really know what it takes to light a lot of these lights or a lot of these new HDMI lights. And it seems like they do a lot of this new lighting does take a little more ampage, if that's if that's right. You know, I just. Like I said, we just get the vehicles. We support what's needed. So if that's what people say, we need the 1600 amp, that's what we do. We get it there. Yeah, and and I think it's sometimes you have a generator that's just on the electric truck and that's the size that comes with the truck. And, and so even if you don't need that much power, that's the package that was rented to the production and that's what they have. Um, I think there is a uh fear that like what if the dp calls for a bigger light and we didn't have a plan but we don't we you know we even if you do a bunch of planning and you think you know what the package is going to be um it runs late you need to you need to bring out a couple 18ks you're going to need a bigger generator for that so i think that there's this idea of always being ready for everything so that you always are carrying around a larger or the largest generator so that you are ready for whatever might be needed um and I think sometimes just the smaller generators are not available. And, and so having more supply of different sizes and also making sure that you're asking for tier three and tier four generators. Those are going to be the cleanest burning, most efficient generators as well. Um, so it's kind of all of the above. But at the bottom line, I don't think that there's enough power planning conversations really actually happening now. Right. We make detailed plans about where we're going to park every truck. We make detailed plans about how we're going to eat. We do not currently make detailed plans about how the power we need and how we're going to provide that. And so I think that that would be a change 
in thinking and it would require conversations between transportation and locations and the electricians, of course, um, the ADs and, and like actually having a proper conversation about the power needs at each location and then meeting those needs in the most efficient way. And it just hasn't, that hasn't been a practice because historically fuel has been cheap and, it, and, it, and historically how much you burned wasn't a big deal. So I think it comes down to now being more aware, understanding that we should think about how we plan our power, having those conversations and then choosing the right equipment for the job. And that's, and that's, you know, and to stick up for the vendors, it's, they're giving us what we've asked for, you know, like, I'm sure that David Haddad didn't say, you know what, 1600 amps, I'm going to buy a more expensive generator to put on there because I want to spend more money on a generator. And that's it. You know, I'm sure if we set the tone that we needed a thousand amp generator, the thousand amp generators would have been on the tractors. You know, I, I think it's full responsibility on us as production, you know, as different departments that these are the things that we've told the vendors that we need and they've gone out and accommodated us for our needs. Absolutely. Sounds like there's their production needs to strategize or, or better um, have, have more conversations about planning energy needs. Um, and well, and, and I think our, our suppliers, um, everyone on the call and Haddad's and other big suppliers in New York, everyone is, will be very open to um, figuring out what's the best way forward, right? So I think this is where having that convening conversation and bringing people together and figuring out what is the best way forward. I mean, no one wants to invest in equipment if they don't believe it's gonna get rented. And so I think it's really important that um, we all kind of work together. Um, Emerald, Emerald Trailers is, currently hoping to do like a feasibility study just on this exact purpose. I was having meetings earlier. So if there's any any way to gain engaged information in terms of what the true power needs were, you know, I got I saw some figures before from, you know, people were talking about the draw of uh base camp versus set and whatnot, where we're trying to be those people that can provide that that battery solution on set and give you the option and not be not be worried, be ready for nearly all situations. We're not talking about four 80 foot lifts and, you know, with all the 10 Ks on them, but normal under normal circumstances. So uh, if there's anything I can do to help be part of that conversation, I would very much like to be. And that's in my experience, if, you know, the studio commits to spending the money on the thing they want, the vendor's gonna go out there and build it for them you know, and, and, and start renting it. So that's where it comes from. As long as the money's there and as long as they're committed to renting the vehicle, they'll go on and build whatever you want. Exactly right. Amazing. Uh, such great questions. Uh, thank you so much. It's, unless there's other questions that are coming through on the chat, uh, that's all the questions that were asked. Uh, but there was such great conversation, such great insights. Um, thank you so much to all of the panelists. Um, thank you. Uh, and so now we're gonna move it to the open forum where anybody can ask any questions on sustainable production, if there are any, um, and they don't have to necessarily be about fuel reduction strategies. Uh, panelists, you're welcome to stay for that office hours section. Um, Let's check the chat. Okay. So I don't think any any questions or any more questions are coming through uh, on the chat. Um, so I just, I really wanna thank you all again. Um, I wanna thank the panelists, MOM, um, and the New York City Film Green Program. Um, for hosting this workshop uh, and for providing this space for us to, to learn um, and to continue to try to reduce our industry's impact, especially with such a, um, a big impact area um, like the transportation uh, department. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and I do wanna remind everyone about the next panel uh, the next panel will be on March 14th. Uh, it'll be on sustainability on screen and normalizing sustainable choices and actions for our audiences. 
um, and it'll include green storytelling um, and products on screen. Uh, and Noel, if you will put up the slides again, yeah, for that last page. Oh, perfect. We have some resources and tips available for everyone. Um, the, this is contact information for some of the panelists here, uh, but also some tips from the Green Production Guides Peach, uh, the Production Environmental and Accounting Checklist. Uh, take a screenshot um, and try to uh, enact as many on your productions or, or be mindful of your um, energy usages uh, on set. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see how you can follow um, MOM uh, on social media. They are at Made in New York. This is their website uh, where you can get access to all previous panels as well um, and recordings. This episode was also recorded and will be posted to the New York City Film Green website where you can watch it. Uh, and rewatch it as many times as you'd like. Uh, and then you can also um, follow uh, Earth Angel on social media and um, check out the Earth Angel website for more information and more resources uh, and uh, see how you can work with us. Um, but thank you. Uh, unless there's more questions, let's go to the chat. Thank you. Uh, everyone's saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Perfect. Um, panelists, do you have any last last words? Thank you for having Thanks us. For having us. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, and I guess that concludes our our panel and our workshop today. Let's see. Take care. Oh, and uh, there is another question. Is there any training from the unions happening on this? Um, I'll say not that I know of, but it's, I mean, it's going to have to happen sooner than later. And I think once the tech hits the sets, you're going to have to, everyone's going to want to know about it, be able to operate it or, and hopefully that'll be something that 52 and 817 can have combined efforts in. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I guess head to your local union and um, check. There's always some kind of workshops going on um, and trainings. Uh, I guess it's just on your local area. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again. Uh, and yes, that concludes our panel. Thank you. Hey guys. Bye everyone. <laughs>